Hello and welcome to today's webinar discussing contemporary gold standards in implantology workflow and augmentative surgery. My name is Angelo Trötan and I'm your host today. I'm teaching maxillofacial surgery, oral surgery and implantology at my universities and currently I'm the president of the International Academy of Ultrasonic Surgery and Implantology. So before we start the planning in our patients, of course, we have to reveal the unseen. Until now, we always used two-dimensional depiction of um, heart structures in our patients, like bone metals, etc., etc. But contemporary diagnosis allows us to visualize our patient's anatomy in 3D. That means that we have to leave, let's say, the old traditional techniques because we know about the advantages of 3D. What do we know in comparison? Panoramic X-rays diagnosis only shows a two-dimensional overlay picture of complex three-dimensional anatomy. Second, CBCT diagnosis reveals pathologies unseen in panoramic X-rays and allows precise individual determination of delicate structures, which is very important regarding nerves, vessels, and, for instance, sinus membranes. And of course, CBCT allows bone quality determination, a precise surgical planning in the third dimension, and the entire digital workflow from planning up to the aesthetic prosthetic treatment. Just to give you a comparison, like in normal JPEG photos or photos you take with your smartphone, you will see only a two-dimensional depiction of what you photograph in the third dimension. Contrary with the CBCT, Instead of having pixels on your photo, you have voxels, which you can turn around and look from all different sides. Just to give you a comparison, when I was planning my uh, dental clinic here in Vienna, of course, the architect was drawing a plan to show me where he thinks that he's going to place all the different operating rooms, the um, radiology department, oral hygienics, etc., etc. But contrary, if you are able to depict your new clinic in the third dimension. You can already imagine the workflow you are keeping up with your patient. That means where does the patient enter? Where, where is the reception desk? How does the patient move? To have the optimized workflow in your treatment, in your guiding the patient through the different uh, stations between diagnosis and the final treatment. So how does CBCT the depiction of our patient's anatomy help us in the third dimension. Of course, we can use it also for enhancement of daily routine diagnostics where it's very important. For instance, if you are not quite sure if a two-dimensional intraoral x-ray depicts the real issue a patient is just complaining about pains in the upper front, then of course you might have some suspect if there could be a granuloma, but you are not be sure because the two-dimensional intraoral x-ray just is an overlay picture of different bone layers, which can give you a false positive or a false negative diagnosis. Instead, when you go into the third dimension, you perfectly see that here is definitely a granuloma. Of course, also regarding endodontics, of course, here in the two-dimensional intraoral x-ray, you can see that there is a reduction of uh, hard tissue substance around the apex, but you don't know how far does this reduction, this bone resorption go. So when you're going into the third dimension, of course, you will see that the entire buccal bone plate is missing and that this tooth cannot be, let's say, saved by epiectomy or something or similar surgical procedures. So it gives you a just safer diagnosis on what you will have to do to treat this patient. And of course, which you will never be able to see in two-dimensional x-rays is if there are some longitudinal fractures in the course of the root, vertical fractures of the root, which can only be depicted in the third dimension. Of course, also the periodontal state can be diagnosed diagnosed much more precisely with CBCT because you can see and you can depict if there is already bone resorption in the forcation and this gives you a much better guidance for your therapy concept. 
Last but not least, of course, uh, when it comes to impacted teeth, especially impacted wisdom teeth in the mandible, then of course you will have to know where is the course of the mandible nerve. And with the three-dimensional depiction, you will have a much safer um, surgical planning. And of course, also regarding impacted or mesiodense diagnosis, you will see if the mesiodense, which you can see down here, is more to the buccal side or more to the palatal side. But today's focus will, of course, be more regarding the use of CBCT for enhancement of implant and GBR planning. Actually, you can use or you will have to use the CBCT for virtually any surgical planning in the future. When it comes to vertical alveolar crest splitting for the narrow alveolar crest, when it comes to sinus lifting or the intralift procedure, which I will present later on. Of course, when we speak about the subperiostal tunnel technique, mandibular nerve transposition, distraction and sandwich osteotomies, and of course, regarding bone block grafting, so that you can already, before you start your surgery, you can determine what is going to be the size of the bone block and where is the optimum position to harvest it. Of course, you can nowadays also use CBCT diagnostics as a non-invasive treatment planning and the prediction of reduction of risk of failure. So how does this work? We presented a randomized clinical trial at Madrid uh, conference of the European Association of Osseointegration, asking the question, can CBCD bone densitometry predict implant stability in augmented sites, which was, as I told you before, a randomized clinical trial. So what is the background of this? Until now, the only way to determine the biological bone quality, the biomechanical bone quality in our patient was intrasurgically. That means we were using the insurgent torque value or, of course, also the OSTEL test after insertion of implant to determine how is the primary stability to judge how many implants we need, if we need some more additional implants and how long will be the healing period because we know the primary implant stability determines the long-term success of implant therapy. Of course, we know also that from pre-surgical CBCT-based bond densitometry, that it significantly correlates with intrasurgical implant stability measurement in native bone. So what we wanted to know in our study was if this is not only valid for native bone, but also for augmented bone. So for this, we undertook a clinical study. We investigated pre-surgical CBCD-based bone densitometry, if it might significantly correlate with intrasurgical insertion torque values, not only in native maxillary bone, but also in augmented sinus lift sites after healing with different bone graft materials. So the randomized controlled clinical trial took place between 2017 and 2019. <clears throat> the study group comprised of 101 patients with 114 intralift sites. I will explain in a few minutes how the intralift works. It's a piezotone based surgical method, minimal invasive. And the control group comprised of 27 patients with 27 implant sites, which provided enough subantral crest height of native bone. Of course, we randomly allocated different types of bone graft materials just to see if there is a significant correlation between uh, the basic situation and the final clinical outcome and if it correlates with the insertion torque value. We, of course, inserted standard implants in every case and the investigated para parameters were calibrated CBCT-based bone density on it bone densitometry with the X-Mind Trium CBCT and of course the insertion torque value which we um, investigated with the implant center 2 and from and iSurge Plus from Actium Company. So how does the surgical procedure work? Uh, back in 2007 my research group developed the so-called 
Atraumatic Transcrestal Hydrodynamic Ultrasonic Cavitational Sinus Lift, which is a very long word, so we just put a short term, it's the intralift. Instead of a buckle approach, we utilize a small booklet flag on top of the crest, a transalveolar approach, and with uh, uh, tips, piezotone tips, which are diamond coated, we just prepare a transcrestal approach to the sinus floor. And once the sinus floor is opened, not with mechanical instruments, but with hydrodynamic pressure, we separate the sinus membrane from the bony antral floor to create a sufficient volume to stuff the bone graft material. Then later on, of course, we fill the bone graft material. In case of our study, we place different types of bone graft materials. And finally, after the healing period finished, which was about uh, seven to eight months, we inserted the implants. And during the insertion, we measured the insertion torque value to determine the biomechanical stability of the bone. So here you can see a clinical case, how the intralift works with the diamond coated tips for the piezotome, we just prepare a transcrestal excess. <clears throat> and as you can see, in this case, it was planned to insert some more implants. So the flap was a little bit wider because in this case, it was possible to insert implants simultaneously. And I will get to this later on in this lecture, why we use ultrasonic surgical instruments to open the sinus floor, because Ultrasonic surgical instruments, piezotome surgical instruments, provide the maximum safety regarding perforation of the sinus membrane. So once the sinus floor is opened, you can see here now, this is the uh, trumpet tip, the intralift four tip, which elevates the sinus membrane. It's sealed into the transcrestal approach. And within five seconds, you can count here down on the right side, by applying hydrodynamic pressure, the sinus membrane is elevated from the sinus floor. And just to give you the possibility to check if you are successful when the patient is breathing, of course, all the saline solution you were inserting between the subantral floor and the sinus membrane will come back. And you can do also visual inspection, the Valsalva test, as you can see here, the sinus membrane is floating back and forth during breathing like the sail in the wind. And of course, this is very important to know because you know then that the sinus membrane is not perforated. Of course, now in the next step, we apply the bone graft material. And in case of our study, it were four different types of bone graft materials because we wanted to know about the biomechanical properties of different types of bone graft materials. And as you can see, it's just a very, very small crystal flap. Very, very small crystal flap. And it's just an approach, a transcrestal opening of 2.8 millimeters. In this case, this was not a case uh, which was part of our study. This was a case uh, during a live surgery we presented some years ago, but uh, it should give you a nice understanding how the intralift works. Because if the remaining subantral alveolar bone provides enough primary stability to the implants, the intralift procedure is designed in a way that you can, of course, insert implants immediately during the entire surgical process. That means, as you, as you will be able to see here, in this case, with one small crestal approach in the area where you want to insert the implants, you're able to do a big sinus lifting of a volume of up to 2.5 cubic centimeters on one hand. And of course, if your implant system allows and the remaining subantral alveolar crest provides sufficient primary stability to the implants, you can insert the implants simultaneously. Just to give you an idea how this looks from the inside of the sinus, you see here a video which was taken from inside of the sinus. The elevation 
of the sinus membrane and the plugging of the bone graft material. And all this with the intralift you can do by a 2.8 millimeter small transcrestal approach. Here you can see a case where it's a single place in the first molar region. It's just a very, very small incision. That means it's maximum atraumatic for the patient. So when we come to the follow-up of our study, you can see here the three-dimensional depiction of the cases. Uh, sometimes it was split mouth cases where we inserted two different kinds of bone graft material uh, on one side and on the other side. And here you can see the densitometry, which was undertaken with the X-Mind Trium CBCT, because it's one of the only devices right now that provides calibrated Hounsfield values to determine the bone density. And as you can see, it's also very, very helpful because it's color-coded. Once you see all green, that means very, very high bone density. Better bone density than the natural subantral alveolar crest would provide to the patient. So this is in comparison native bone. And as you can see, in this case, also the XMind Trium CBCT software helps you in diagnosis and in determination of the bone quality. This is native subantral bone where uh, implants then were inserted to determine the insertion torque value. And as you can see here, it's more reddish and there is very, very little dark green, meaning that, of course, the bone density is much less uh, dense then compared to augmented sites. Let's come to the results. Um, as you can see here in the tables, when we compare the Hounsfield values with the insertion torque values, which were the only way to determine the biomechanical quality of the bone, they have a very, very nice correlation. As you can see here, this is one of the bone graft materials. It was a hydroxy appetite containing bone graft material provides all green, very, very high bone density, while the native bone provides significantly less biomechanical stability and bone density. And the correlation was in all cases highly significant. Once again, you can see the distribution pattern, um, the correlation between the Hounsfield values and the insertion torque values correlate precisely and significantly. That means what is the final result of our study? And once again, I want to remind you until now, the biomechanical stability determination of the bone where we, where we, in, where we are inserting the implants up to now was only during surgery. So that means there could have been a surprise, you insert the implant and with the Ocell test or with the ITV measurement, you were finding out, oh my God, the bone has not the proper quality to sustain for a long period of time for the patient. Because we know that the biomechanical bone quality correlates significantly with the long-term outlook for the success rates of our implants. So what is the clinical implication of our study? that CBCT bone densitometry can safely and accurately predict the degree of primer stability of implants in augmented sinus lift sites already before surgery, as it was demonstrated for native bone. That CBCT bone densitometry non-invasively reveals significant differences of biomechanical bone quality outcome between different types of biomaterials used for sinus lifting. This is also very important because what we want to achieve is not necessarily only autologous bone or regenerated bone. We know that the bone quality in the maxilla is quite poor, but for long-term success of our implants, of course, we need biomechanically highly stable bone compared a, a stability, biomechanical quality comparable to the mandible. So this is so important to know when we choose our bone graft materials, but this is a completely different topic. Last but not least, CBCD bone densitometry might be a, and is a reliable tool to predict long-term success rate of implant therapy and might serve as non-invasive tool 
for pre-surgical decision making whether immediate or delayed implant loading should be preferred. Of course, patients read Dr. Google. They know, okay, there are some types of implants where you can do an immediate loading after implant insertion. The problem is the people don't understand or the patients don't understand that there is a correlation. If you have a poor bone quality, of course, you cannot do immediate loading. But it's very, very difficult for you as a clinician to convince the patient why in case A this might be possible, but in case B it might not be, be possible. Or that it might be possible in the anterior lower front, but it's not possible in the lateral maxilla of the same patient. With this tool and with the pre-surgical determination of bone quality, already before the entire planning of your therapy starts, you can already inform your patient that an immediate loading in a certain area will be possible and in another area it won't be possible and you can prove it to the patient. It's not just say hearsay, because then the patient will say, yeah, but Dr. Gould says, in this case, you can say, no, I know the bone quality in this area where we want to insert the implants is not good enough for immediate loading. You will lose the implant, you will have pain, you will have high cost, and the bone is lost. We cannot place a new implant at this site. So let's take a look how a full CBCT-based digital workflow in oral implantology works. We take a very, very common case, which is the clinical situation up here from the lady. It's a very, very narrow alveolar crest in the right upper maxilla. So how does the CBCT-based planning work step by step? And I have to inform you that, of course, in any case, in the maxilla, of course, you can offer the patient a sinus lift. But the more patient reads Dr. Google, I always come back to this, uh, to this term, Dr. Google. Um, maybe they had some friends who had bad experiences with sinus lift surgery because there was a rupture, they lost the bone graft material, there was an infection, etc., etc. So, unfortunately or fortunately, um, it's always up to the patient to decide which type of surgery the patient wants and which type of surgery the patient rejects. And according to the wishes of the patient or to the limits the patient sets towards us, we have to design the therapy so that the outcome is the same. Let's take a look at the situation of this patient. In this case, enhanced by 3D implantological workflow, for the first time, we are able to do a retroengineering because we always have to keep in mind what is the target of our therapy. The target of our therapy is always the prosthetic treatment. So what we will have to do first in our diagnostic and therapy planning setup, we want to know where do we have to place the prosthetic treatment. How is the optimum prosthetic treatment performed so that the patient is on one hand happy with the aesthetics and on the other hand, if it's also functional correct. So in the first step, of course, you do the prosthetic setup. And following the prosthetic setup, you can see here, you can apply different filters so that you can see it from all different sides. You can adjust the crowns, you can make bigger crowns and you can set them in the optimum position for the implant treatment and for the occlusion. Here you can see the next step. Of course, in this case, the alveolar crest was very, very narrow. On top of the alveolar crest, we simply had 1.2 millimeter alveolar crest width. But in the planning phase, you want to know where do I insert the implant. So the implants are inserted. The first one in the first premolar region, of course, is quite clear. This can be placed anatomically completely correct. But as you can see here, of course, we were discussing the patient doesn't want to receive a sinus lifting procedure. So we will have to do a compromise in this case. So the second implant then, of course, is placed very, very adjacent to the start of the sinus. 
And once again, as you can see here, once the implant is placed, it's the uh, first premolar, you can determine the bone density of the native bone. Of course, everything where you can see air, where we, there is no bone, of course, in the bone densitometry with the x mind trium CBCT, you will see some reddish, of course, because there is no bone. But first, we want to know where do we want to insert our implants so we, that we can do the proper planning of the bone augmentative surgery. Here, we get now to the bone densitometry and placement of the second premolar implant and we place this right close adjacent to the uh, start of the sinus floor and of course this is not going to be in the perfect anatomical position but of course in this case we will have to do a compromise but you can visualize the compromise and you can start to discuss with the dental technician if this is manageable also from the prosthetic side to give the patient an almost fail-safe therapy plan. Of course, later on, you can depict this in the third dimension. You can see here the bone density also of the second uh, premolar inserted implant, where there is air or where there is no bone. You, of course, see red. But the native bone, as far as the implant can be inserted now in this planning phase, looks quite greenish so that it means it's sufficient and of course last but not least you cannot you can also export all your planning automatically into a report sheet and hand it over to the patient so that the patient will perfectly understand what the treatment is going to be now in the next step of course you export your three-dimensional skull for printing and for the dental technician the software provides you all the tools that you need. You don't need to export the DICOMs and use another software. This is all integrated in the, into the XMind Trium software. You can export in different types of file formats like STL, etc., etc., the skull of your patient. And you can start to design your splints. You can start to design your surgical guides, etc., etc. Once again, you will see here now, this is the prosthetic treatment, the implant uh, insertion, and this is the export of the model. Here you can see this exported model, which then can be manipulated in any other software you want to deal with. You can use, once again, different types of filters to visualize how the surgical procedure will be. And this is what you can hand over to your dental technician to do a primary setup of the prosthetic treatment and discuss with the dental technician if this is manageable or not. But we get one step further in this case. Of course, we know that we can do crest splitting. So instead of using autologous bone block for adpositional bone block grafting on the buccal side, we use the, the mucoperiost uh, flap-free Piezotome crest split, which my research group developed. And for this, we can also design a template. So here you can see the overpositioning of the STL model, of the exported model. And then we can start to insert the surgical guide. And the surgical guide tells us how far do we have to split and distract the osteotomy site. Here you can see an overlay picture. This is the original anatomical situation of your patient in the third dimension. And these are the necessities. A virtual surgery that you can do. How far do you have to distract? How deep do you have to cut into the bone for the vertical osteotomy, for the horizontal distraction? And this you can also depict and export for a thorough surgical planning. And of course, you can do also a surgical guide for the crest split procedure, which helps you to determine the correct angle where you want to do the vertical osteotomy. Once again, you do the creation of the crest split template, which is here uh, depicted in yellow. You can do an overlay of all 
planning situations of all steps of your planning. And of course, you can watch it in the third dimension. Look at it from all different sides just to investigate if this is correct, if the occlusal situation is correct, if the implant angulation is correct, and if the split, the proper class breast split is set properly. So, once you have the planning, you already have the entire planning in your head. So, what does this mean? You were doing the surgery already virtually, so you already have the picture in your head, so there is much less risk to have some bad, um, bad experiences during surgery, some, some sudden um, surprises where something doesn't go the way you like to have it go. So, this is a depiction of the crest split procedure as we developed it already back in 2009. It's a vertical osteotomy and horizontal distraction. But why do we use or why do we have to use piezotome surgical instruments nowadays? Because they are simply superior to rotating instruments. Um, the reason why I can state this explicitly is because we know that piezotome surgery preserves and stimulates the full biological functionality of endosteum and periosteum by least traumaticity on bone and soft tissues. Second, piezotome surgery initiates bone healing with the first cut by ultrasonic cavitational stimulation of soft and hard tissue healing and provides maximum safety for delicate soft tissues. And of course, piezotome surgery leads to more than 50% less patient morbidity. But how can I state this? Unfortunately, now I have to give you some very basic and dry scientific backgrounds. But when we speak about ultrasonic piezotome surgery, what does this mean? As you can see here, uh, the tip that you are using to cut bone, to scrape bone, to model bone, to modify bone, is simply oscillating at a rate of 28,000 to 36,000 oscillations per second, not per minute, per second. And this mechanism creates in liquids the so-called cavitation effect. That means the piezotome surgical instruments, it's not cutting like a conventional saw or rotary burr by scraping and smashing off the bone. No, it's creating the cavitation effect that builds up small little micro explosion of gas bubbles that's separating the tissues atraumatically. To give you a short example, this is one of the tips we use for sinus lifting. And as you can see here, although you can see the tip macroscopically, macroscopically does not move, you see that there, is a, that there is a lot of action going on on top of the tip. That means what you can see here, all the squirts of the liquid ejecting from the top of the tip, this is the cavitation effect. So, although you virtually don't move the tip as a mechanical action to manipulate the bone, the cavitation effect and the microscopic oscillations of the tip will do the action for you, bone lossless. How do I get to this? We did, of course, a lot of experiments in our research group and we also investigated the differences. How is it when I cut bone with rotary burrs? What is left over? Because our resources are limited. When we do autologous bone block grafting, of course, we have limited resources. So, once you cut bone with the piezotome, almost bone lossless, and with the tips we designed, you're able to precisely cut bone lossless. And you compare it with microburrs, you see with microburrs, you have a procedural bone loss of sometimes more than 50%. So, that means you're devastating the bone on one hand, and on the other hand, you're losing the bone that you need for bone augmentation. And also, this is just a side uh, letter, of course, also, unfortunately, with laser, the situation is not much better. Now, let's get to the maximum soft tissue protection. As you can see here, piezotomes have a cutting selectivity. They cut only bone. You can see here, I hold the piezotome handpiece with the same adjustments that I need for cutting bone. 
and press it on the eye bulb of the sheep head. And you don't see any type of lesion. And without interrupting the action of the bone, you can see here now, with the same oscillation pattern, you can cut the bone. And what does this mean for you? So, you can cut bone, but once you get close to delicate structures, like the mandible nerve, the sinus membrane, etc., etc., this cutting selectivity, this maximum soft tissue protection, will avoid, to a very, very high extent, of course, with every instrument you can put a nerve lesion if you press too hard on the nerve, but with the maximum safety, with piezotomes, you're almost, almost unable to hurt soft tissues if you use the piezotome in the correct way. I just give you a short demonstration here for a lateral approach sinus lift. So once again, with diamond coated tips and by the oscillation and by the ultrasonic cavitation effect, you just prepare the bony window. It's then of course up to you to decide if you want to remove the bony window, you want to crush it uh, to, to produce some autologous bone graft material or not. You can see here, the osteotomy is completed. Then in this case, the buccal bone plate, the osteotomy window was removed. And it's also so important to understand, you can see here, this is the blood vessel. And this is another nice feature of the piezotome surgical instruments. Here you can see the tip you have seen before in the uh, high-speed uh, video. It's not that the tip pushes away the sinus membrane. It's the cavitation effect that separates the sinus membrane from the bony floor. So once it's completely separated, you just um, elevate the membrane to your personal needs. And finally, and you see, the chances are very, very little. Of course, if you just press in with the, with the tip of the piezotome and you punch into the sinus membrane, of course, you will be able to do a perforation also with piezotome. But if you use it properly, it's almost impossible. In most cases, of course, nowadays we use PRF because we know that PRF enhances the bone regeneration and we want to achieve a perfect result and a fast result because PRF enhances and speeds up bone healing together with the effects of the piezotome. Then we place some bone graft material mixed with uh, PRF. And this is just a straightforward and very, very relaxed surgery, the lateral approach sinus lift with piezotome. No worries for perforation. Always keep in mind, keep it, uh, use the piezotome in the correct way with the right adjustments. And finally, then we can place, of course, the autologous bone block again back. Sometimes I just leave it on the sinus membrane and I just flip it up uh, at the 90 degree angle. So I have a nice depiction also in two dimensional radiographs. And finally, the opened window then is covered with PRF membranes. And always keep in mind, it's just fibrin. So if there is a bleeding and if there is a stable blood clot, it's exactly the same. It's only that the PRF concentrates all the bone regenerative proteins. And that's the only difference between the natural blood clot and PRF. So I was speaking about speed of bone healing. So this is a very, very questionable um, pronouncement announcement for piezotomes but this was also investigated on the histological lab. So what we know, what we perfectly know from clinical studies, and we also experienced this in experimental studies, and it was proven that once you cut bone with piezotomes, after seven days, the amount and the activity of osteoblasts is more than 100% higher than with rotary instruments. After two weeks after your surgery with piezotome surgical instruments, the activity and the number of osteoblasts is almost four times higher 
than with rotary instruments. Because with rotary instruments, you are destroying bone, you are crushing bone. You interrupt the nutrition of the bone, which you do not do with the piezodome. And of course, you have uh, micromolecular biological side effects that stimulate the bone regeneration. And even 56 days after surgery, you will find more osteoblast activity and more osteoblasts, significantly more osteoblasts in the surgical side compared to rotary instruments. And of course, this was also determined by Professor Reside that the bone healing is significantly faster, the clinical outcome, what you can see in radiographs and what you can see then when you re-enter the surgical site is significantly higher when you work on bone with piezotomes. So let's speak about post-surgical morbidity. So when we started to work only or we switched uh, completely from rotary instruments to only use of piezotomes, we did a comparative split mouse study in our patients um, and investigated why, because this was the clinical impression, why suddenly when working with piezotomes, the people have to, the patients have to endure less pain and swelling. So we investigated this in our split mouse study and we found out that once we take the pain and swelling rate with rotary instruments at one as 100%, there was a reduction of more than 50% in pain and swelling when we use the piezotomes. You can find down here the reference and you're free to download it for free from this open source journal. So as a meta-analysis we published back in 2017, we can now, based on pure scientific evidence, state clearly that compared to rotary instruments, Using piezotomes, we have a minimized uh, terminal bone necrosis. We have a smooth osteotomy surface, which is also one of the most important parts in bone surgery procedures. We have a bacterial contamination prevention because we use the ultrasonic waves to kill the bacteria. We have an improved bone healing. We have a high precision bone cut design. Of course, you cannot cut curves with rotary instruments with such a precision uh, precision as with piezotomes. We have an almost lossless bone cut and with the CS tips, I will demonstrate it right away. We have a lossless bone cut. We have a precise depth control, which is only part, uh, partly possible with rotary instruments. We have a perfect prevention of soft tissue injuries like nerves and sinus membranes. And we have a significant reduction of post-surgical patient morbidity. These are simple scientific facts. You may look up, it's a very, very long article we published in the International Journal of Oral and Craniofacial Science back in 2017, where all the references, and it's hundreds of references, prove that uh, piezotome surgery is superior and is the new gold standard when it comes to bone surgery. So these are some references uh, you may also look up here, but I will do this very quick. So let's get back to our case I presented to you before. This was the narrow alveolar crest where we did already the three-dimensional virtual planning and where we did the virtual surgery on our patient's X-Mind Trium CBCT scan. As you can see here, now there is the minimal invasive uh, incision of the mucoperiosteum on top of the alveolar crest because it's a flapless procedure. It's the flapless piezotome breast split we developed. And then we use the tips that my research group developed to do a vertical osteotomy exactly according to the surgical planning and the virtual surgery I presented to you before. And this is now the vertical osteotomy. And when we do a superimposition of this, then of course we do the widening according to the surgical planning we did before in the virtual planning based on the x trium CBCT scan. We know already the widening angle. We know how this distracted bone part should look like. 
so that we have the safety that everything goes according to plan. Then, of course, we insert the implant. And when we do a superimposition, of course, if you have a 3D virtual reality glass, you can do this during the surgery. You can do the superimposition with different filters and check if you are in the right position. Here we did again uh, going back to the mucoperiosteal incision. And now we want to know how does it match to the surgical planning. This is just for you, if you have a virtual glass, you can do this during the surgery just to make sure that you're in the right position and that your overlays and planning is correct. But of course, as long as you don't have a, three, uh, a 3D glass, of course, you cannot do the superimposition uh, intrasurgically. So this is why I present it to you. Just to give you the safety that you know, whatever you do in the virtual planning with the XMind Trium CBCT software, matches 100% to the clinical situation. So you can use different filters, which you might prefer. Here again, this is the first osteotomy, which we'll check if it's correct. Here is the first step of the osteotomy, the vertical osteotomy you can see here. This is what we did in the virtual planning. It matches 100% and the final result. I go back again. Okay, so this is the clinical situation and it matches 100% with the superimposition with your virtual guided surgery in the virtual surgery with the XMind Trium CBCD software. And of course, then the depiction of the implants inserted. Here you can see precisely on the spot. Then, of course, we place some bone graft in between. And finally, we do the suturing. And once again, now you can see here, this is a post-surgical CBCT, XMind Trium CBCT. And once again, you can check with the templates you have created before in your virtual surgery. You can check yourself if your surgery was performed in the correct way. And here you can see the superimposition. These are the original, these are the implants inserted and you can superimpose all your planning and check was the implant insertion in the correct place. And this gives a full new experience. It just gives you such a nice safety and, and uh, good feeling during surgery because there are not going to be any surprises because you perfectly know the three-dimensional anatomy of your patient. You can plan everything. You can check if the planning is doable. And then once you're sure your planning is correct, then you just transpone it to your patient's surgical site. So this is the patient case after surgery, post-surgical follow-up and control, the superimposition of the implants to determine the bone, um, the bone density, as you can see here, green from the crest up to the top. Here with the superimposition, you see there are only very, very slight difference by tens of millimeters in the position of the implants. According to the planning, here is now the bone density measurement, the superimpositions with different filters. So to get to an end of this lecture, once again, I have to repeat, we were living with traditional, we were raised up with traditional instruments like rotary instruments, 2D radiography. Now, I just want to give you a comparison. Some um, in, in, the, in the late 80s and 90s of the last century, this was a top-notch mobile telephone. It was the first mobile telephone ever seen. Nobody was experiencing someone who is walking on the street and phoning. Of course, this was a very, very big apparatus. Nowadays, this is how technology gets forward. Nowadays, everybody has this and everybody is phoning on the street, on the mountains, wherever you are. So, also in medicine, we have the obligation to use modern te technology for the benefit of our patient to do a more precise planning 
from surgery up to the prosthetic treatment and to avoid failures to the patient, to reduce the risks for our patients, because a lot of things we do are quite risky. So, of course, the question is, would you buy still a phone like this or a phone like this? And it's the same with switching from two-dimensional radiography to three-dimensional radiography. Because, of course, in the everyday routine, when you do an antodontic treatment, etc., etc., of course, you will still use two-dimensional radiography like panoramic x-rays and intraoral x-rays. Why? Because we know that in certain cases, we don't need to reveal the unseen. But once it's not quite clear from the panoramic x-ray if there could be some additional pathologies in our patients, like you can see here with the left sinus, a very, very strange situation, periodontal situation here, and not so clear situation here, then of course, nowadays you will have to switch over to three-dimensional depiction of your patient's anatomy. Because what you can see here is, in the molar region, a complete destruction of the periodontium. And what you have not seen here, in the canine region, there is another big cyst. So it's our obligation to serve our patients as best as possible and to avoid surprises to ourselves when it gets to the surgery. Just imagine, you were planning here a sinus lifting procedure without noting, uh, without knowing that there is a very, very strong sinusitis that prevents you from doing sinus lift surgery. And when you are starting to say, yeah, here we can do tooth extraction and simultaneous implant insertion, and you do it, and then you find out that you have a big cyst here, well, then you're in trouble. Because first of all, uh, you're heading straight into complications. You're not prepared to face what you have to do in this case. You have to completely switch your therapy planning. And this is so important that you know before you start your surgery what could be the surprises and do a proper planning. And when it comes to the execution of the surgery, of course, which surgical instruments would you choose if you are the patient? I mean, this photo looks quite funny because it's just a chisel and it's a, it's a stone for hammering. But actually, when you take a look and you're, um, on your hand instruments, uh, of course, the dimensions are different, but you are working like this dentist. You're working with chisels, you are destroying bone. So if you are the patient, I'm pretty sure you would also choose to have the most precise, the most gentle and the most atraumatic treatment possible. Because first of all, the success rate is, is, is significantly higher on one hand. And on the other hand, the pain load and uh, the morbidity after the surgery is more than 50% less with hiatotome surgical instrumentation. And some surgeries are only possible with piezotomes and are not possible with rotary instruments. I thank you very, very much for your kind attention. I hope I made clear why also we as a community of dentists and oral surgeons and maxillofacial surgeons, we have to move on and adapt to new technologies, which might be obligatory in a few years. So let's just be on the head front of this movement that we improve the quality of our planning and the quality of surgery in our patients without surprises. If you want to have further information, you are free to look up every lecture we present and every surgical video and educational videos in training you in the piezotome surgical methods at our homepage www.inyausi.org with free access. So I thank you very much for your attention. And now I ask you to ask me questions that you're interested in. Thank you very, very much.